Welcome to Navigating Change, everyone. My name is Pete Wright, and I'm joined once again by Howard Teibel. Hello, Pete. Hi, Howard. Good to talk to you again. Always good with you. We uh, have a uh, another great topic uh, this week. We're going to be talking about virtual teams, and virtual teams uh, offer a whole bunch of challenges. I think that uh, that come in with working with people people that uh, that are not sitting right next to you. But I I, I think uh, over the last several years, since the virtual teams have have really taken off, in uh, you know uh, certainly in this country, we've seen. Uh, you know the 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 terminology is starting to change, and and now it's not just a virtual team, but it's a complex and globally distributed team, which now means you, you know we're we're adding extra layers of complexity uh, into working together with our peers to get work done and deliver results. Uh, you know this is something I imagine you deal with uh, often in your work with clients. Uh, what are the things that that you run into that uh, that virtual teams have trouble addressing that that you just don't have when you're working face to face? Well, it's interesting. You know, people often think about virtual teams in a negative way, but in a positive way. Uh, you know, I have found in doing some projects where I do have people in different time zones that, and I'm just going to throw this out initially. I have found that if you can time the. Uh, creation or feedback. So I get something from you. There's always this delay that happens. And that's always the challenge in, in project management is how do you factor in the delay? Well, when you're working with teams across time zones, you could actually use that to your advantage where you go to bed at night, you've given them the information. And when you wake up in the morning, you have the solution. Uh, in teams that are geographically in the same time zone, there is this arbitrary delay that becomes sometimes difficult to um, to deal with. So that's just one positive thing. You know, and I'm always looking for those for those ways that you could leverage what appears to be a liability, but it can also be an asset. Sure. Aside from that though, uh, I think there are lots of other challenges associated with it. You know, I was talking to uh, someone that works in a uh, a large company and they do project management work uh, developing this a different product, and they've got basically their project manager in Ireland, their developers in Minnesota, and their analysts in Massachusetts, and the customer is in Costa Rica. So <laughs> you cannot get more virtual than that. And, you know, one of the things that I was discussing with them was, you know, how do we, how do we, how can we improve this? I mean, how can we improve how we do our job? And it starts with really understanding what are the challenges. Uh, so, I think there are a couple that show up that are w worth reflecting on. First is that when you're dealing with virtual teams, there are a lot of nonverbal cues that are lost uh, when you're dealing with conference calls or you're dealing with email, which is, you know, even if you're not in the, you can be in the same office, person next to you, and you're not even talking to them, you're using email. But aside right. from that, uh, the non-verbal cues are so critical, and you know I think maybe the next generation is going to have more comfort not having to rely on non-verbal cues. But I can know for my generation, and I and I think for a lot of my peers, there's something lost in translation when you when you don't have the ability to look at someone face to face. So that's that's one thing that I think shows up for a lot of. Uh, teams are that inability to connect. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. It's the importance uh, of eye contact that I hear so often. If I can't look in your eyes, I can't, I don't really know what you're trying to say. Well, you know, what's so interesting about that too, Pete, because, you know, I, you know, whether you're doing video, you and I do video conferencing sometimes. And right, right. what I find powerful about uh, video conferencing is that it's as much about knowing I have your attention than it is about me showing you that I'm that I'm paying attention. That there's a when you are just on a on a uh, you have no idea what the person on the other line is doing if you're just on a conference call. And half the time, if it's a conference call more than five people, half the group is sitting there, you know, playing Yahtzee. Oh, they're doing they're yeah, checking email. They're doing oh, whatever. They're I can adjust. Email. They're absolutely checking email. I come on. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, and they got that thing on mute, and right. they're not even paying attention. So right. it's. So that's the bane of HR is, calls everywhere. <laughs> that's right. So the nonverbal cues is one challenge. Second challenge is I think how we define teamwork. You know, I think 
before we had as much virtual teams, in most organizations, historically, you would have your organization in the same building. And then the, the method that was used, we'd meet, whether we had a daily meeting or a weekly meeting, and that's when we came together. But actually, just as important, I'd run into you in the men's room, and I'm washing my hands, and you're washing your hands, so how was your weekend? And we have this informal conversation. And in that moment, when I have your attention, and you're not busy. Uh, so by the way, Pete, uh, I sent you that email about X. Uh, and Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I didn't tell you. We did, we did deliver that. Boom, done. Mm-hmm. You know, so in the course of social interactions, which is partly what creates this sense of teamwork and trust, I get to know you on a personal basis. It's also a lot of ways work gets done as people sort of passing by each other casually and all those little details come out in those kinds of environments. That gets lost when you have teams in disparate locations. Okay. Third is cultural differences. Here are a few examples of cultural differences uh, that I've seen and I'm familiar with. One is this whole thing about saying no. Uh, Sometimes other cultures, there's a greater reluctance to say no. And the impact of that is if you're working with people who are not comfortable saying no to something, you're not going to have a high degree of performance because they're going to want to do their best, but you're not going to get a sense of really whether they can deliver. And it's also going to make it difficult for them to be able to sort of work with you because they never have that real strong sense of permission uh, because they want to do the right thing. Oh, you know, that's such a great example. I, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if you know this. I spent several years in Korea uh, working over there. And, and, you know, that was exactly my experience. When, when I'm working in a peer-to-peer relationship, because there are all sorts of other issues related to hierarchy and rank in the workplace, but we'll talk about that, you know, later if, if appropriate. The, the, uh, the real issue is if you're working in a peer-to-peer relationship, if I ask somebody, would you do this for me? And they couldn't or wouldn't, they would say no. Now, my response to that, you know, coming from my cultural background is, oh, my goodness, that's a judgment. They're passing judgment on what I just asked them to do. Now, my peers' example, or my peers' perspective on this is, it's not appropriate for me to do this right now. I'm not the person to do it. No is the appropriate answer. It's nothing more than a data point. Uh, Well, for me, I take personal, uh, you know, naturally take personal. uh, It's a personal affront for them. It's it's just another space and time. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a perfect example. And then what ends up happening is you don't have the sort of the more direct or honest kind of way of working together um, that produces sort of effective results and timely results. You know, another example would be. You know, the, the, this whole the, the the difference between hierarchy and sort of informal rank, and you know, in some cultures, to be able to give your opinion, you really need to be in a particular level in the organization. While for your organization, it might be the case that it's expected that regardless of you have uh, formal rank, all ideas are welcome. So knowing whether or not people feel comfortable speaking up because of rank, that's another example where where it might break down. Um, the third one is around what it is to uh, speak about somebody publicly. You know, I think we are, we are learning more about how to give quote-unquote constructive criticism. And I think most people, if it's done well publicly, and if there's trust within the group, uh, it actually works. But in some cultures, it is really not appropriate to come out and give somebody some criticism in front of others. So regardless, those three examples, and, and there, there are many others, the key here is recognizing there are probably different ways people approach the same issue, but because of the way they were brought up or how the cultural culture works, uh, that is a contributor to why teams don't seem to be meshing the way they should. So it, it seems like if, it, you know, and I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm going to go ahead and, and do that. Go for it, Pete. All right. So it seems like when you're talking about, when, when, you're, when you're walking into a situation where you have to help virtual teams, uh, you know, work more efficiently and effectively together, particularly these complex and globally distributed virtual teams, that 
what you're doing is less giving them the the tools and techniques to to uh, you know uh, work together and you know how to send better email may be a part of that, but mostly it's about reframing their idea of what it means to work on a team. Is that is that accurate? Well, that's absolutely true for the for the second point I made about what it means to be. Uh, what 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 is what do we say team? How do we define team? And when it comes down to it, I think everybody wants to feel like they trust their colleagues and they feel comfortable with their colleagues, uh, and 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 that helps. I mean, you know, you wanting to come to work because you like the people you work with it, is important. Ultimately, though, whether you're talking about teams all over the world versus teams all in one physical space. There's, you know, three things that have to be there and the, to focus on with respect to teamwork. And teamwork really is about clearly defined goals and explicitly understanding the roles and responsibilities of who's doing what. And obviously having the right tools to support you. Virtual teams, uh, right tools are very important. Video conferencing, as you and I have done, you, know, you do not have to spend a million dollars to have an effective virtual conference uh, environment. And I'm seeing more and more organizations are putting them in because they're working virtually. Uh, but this whole idea of moving towards finding opportunities to focus on what's core and what's core is who should be doing what and having the goals being clearly defined. This is the foundation of a group being able to get through a challenge or a project. And what I would say to virtual teams are, you need to do even more due diligence to make sure that the goals are clearly defined and uh, explicitly understood. And it comes down to really taking communication to another level. That's really Whereas, interesting because when I come to work every day on a virtual team, on a, on a normal team, I may have the benefit of external stimulus to remind me what I need to be doing every day if, I, right. if, if, it's, if the project is not as well defined. But on a virtual team, when I don't have that, boy, I can, I can totally see that point. I, I, I'd never made that connection before. You have to have an explicitly and perfectly documented project. And then people need to be willing to reflect on it in some kind of periodic way. So how are we doing on are, – are we staying within our roles and responsibilities? Should it change? I think unfortunately because there's so much to do, people forget that the work evolves, the roles evolve. But what we don't do enough of is make – some kind of systematic time, and it doesn't have to be a lot of time, but to step back and go, all right, are the right people doing the right things right now? Sure. So, uh, so let's. Uh, we had a, a, a third point in here, right, which is this one about cultural differences. Uh, how do you address this one? Well, the cultural differences one, I think, comes down to being willing to educate yourself if you are working with. You know, Costa Rica, India, China, Japan, there's obviously going to be practices in these other cultures that you just are not familiar with. So it's incumbent upon you, if, especially if your your job is to run the project, is to understand what are, what are potential some of the differences and then be willing to lift it up in some kind of group conversation and validate if some of your assumptions are true. You could potentially do this privately with somebody who you're working with from another culture. It could be a group conversation. But what I'm suggesting is, is that instead of just having this be in the background and never discussing it, have it, have it come out within the team that there are some cultural differences and this is what, this is what your understanding of them are and can we talk about them. There was a. Oh, see now I'm gonna show my. I'm, I'm gonna highlight my own Your age ig ignorance here. Uh, oh, ignorance. There is a book that is so perfect for this, and it documents how to work with with uh, you know other cultures. And I can't yeah, remember the name yeah, of it. What is that? Do you know? It's it's a great book. It's uh, kiss, bow, or shake hands. That's it. Yeah. Right. The best selling guy for doing business in more than sixty countries. Uh, the author is uh, Terry Morrison, and it's great because it gives you all these little insights about how to approach this problem and what are some ways that 
to think about working with different cultures. Absolutely. That's a, it seems like a, a really good one. And, it, it, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like this is I, I don't mean to harp on my experience in Korea, but just as a as a little highlight, uh, it seems to me that w- it should be even more incumbent on those of us here in the States to do the due diligence and do the work, because most likely the the team members you're working with elsewhere around the globe know more about your culture than you do <laughs> about theirs. Yep, you're right. And I think that we have to work harder to to, to demonstrate that we are interested and willing to uh, learn as opposed to being, uh, you know, the, sort of the giant and, and the, or the, it's, it's almost like there's this, you, you can really demonstrate leadership and trust by being willing to acknowledge and honor other people's cultures. Absolutely. And what a great, that's a great point to, to close it on. So, uh, I will do just that. Howard, thank you again. Uh, for your time this week. It's been a great conversation. We'll do it again. Absolutely. Thank you all for listening. I'm Pete Wright. On behalf of Howard, thanks for listening to Navigating Change. Navigating Change.